It's inside me, this occupation. If I liberate myself from this, I think on the ground, I will be free. Because you cannot be free if you are occupied from inside. When I was 17, I came to Israel for the first time, to this kibbutz, joined an opan, studied Hebrew, and I really felt um, an attachment. I really felt close to the place. I, I was relating as a Zionist. I was relating as somebody looking for Jewish identity. I had been involved, um, not ever religiously, but I had been involved in different youth groups, Jewish youth groups, when I was younger. And um, I just really got the Zionist bug. I'm of the World War II generation. I was born in Vienna. My family had to flee. Came from a very Zionist home. It was uh, very much in the, in the air. And it seemed a natural thing to do. This was 1951. And um, I lived in a kibbutz. I worked in a kibbutz for many years, nearly 20 years. My parents went through the whole Eastern European thing pogroms, refugees, Nazis, and so on. And so this was very, very significant for them, and that was passed on to me. I lived in Jerusalem my whole life, uh, and, and here the conflict is, is very visible. You walk down the street, you have border police checking Palestinians' IDs uh, to see if they accidentally have a green ID, meaning they're not um, residents of Jerusalem, they're not allowed to be here. Um, you really have it everywhere. Of course, we had uh, suicide bombers and terrorist attacks. Um, that's like what I grew up in. So one problem is that people in Israel don't so much know uh, what happened, and uh, they, they don't so much uh, have the, the information. When I came to Israel, I didn't know that there had been people living here before 48. I knew that this was a desert. That's what I knew. Uh, the way it is taught to us in our history classes, it's almost as if our grandparents came to an empty land and settled there. Um, have you ever heard the expression, a land without a people for a people without a land? So this is sort of uh, kind of inaccurate, actually, uh, because there were people there. They were called the Palestinians. When we study in the 1948 war, we study about how we like how the, the, the Arab uh, armies were much more than us and we uh, bravely defeated them. And you know, they ran away because they just ran, they just disappeared, <laughs> they didn't run away. They just were, de were there one day and weren't there the other. Um, and we had nothing to do with it. When we talk about the problematic uh, immigration um, and settling of the Holy Land, of Palestine by, by Jews, it's, it's not a problem, it's not like a problem of their ethnic or religious identity. It's a problem of, um, uh, of the how, of the way in which they sought to settle this land and they're um, seeking political sovereignty um, in the land and the, at the exclusion of the, of, the, um, uh, the, of the local inhabitants, of the Palestinians themselves. Being a Zionist, um, I didn't offer any other kind of uh, worthy solution or alternative to, to the people who were living here before? Well, uh, of course, uh, the, the Israeli narrative starts as that, the, you know, the Jewish people came here to live in peace. And um, the Arabs, you know, Arabs don't, don't know, do not want the Jews to live here. This is how things start. 
so everything that the Arabs are doing are, is hostile to the, to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people who escaped you know, the, the Holocaust and persecution in Europe and all of that, and said never again, they want to defend themselves. This is the basic element of uh, the Israeli narrative of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The fact that we are taught it in this way is really problematic because it means that the Israelis are not taught to acknowledge the fact that the Palestinians also have a right to a homeland in this area. In many respects, the histories of the United States and the history of Israel are very similar. They were both founded on ethnic cleansing. Uh, they were both founded on an exploitation of the indigenous people of the lands that form those countries. In terms of understanding the fundamental of, of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, it's really the fact that Israel today controls 100 percent of historic Palestine. So in other words, if you're going to reconcile the two competing nationalisms of Zionism or Jewish nationalism and Palestinian nationalism, you obviously can't have a situation where one side controls 100 percent of the land. And that's what Israel has done since 1967 when it occupied the Palestinian West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip, in which it continues to do today. We didn't become more secure. We didn't become more safe with what, the way things are going on now. And without developing dialogue with our neighbors, with our enemies, without considering what um, the creation of the of Israel in 48 did to the population that was already living here. Without considering that, without discussing that, without recognizing the fact that there, there, are, there was another history. Uh, there's other countries that live around us that really aren't interested in, in waging war with us. And that we have to solve our differences with the Palestinians some way, one way or another. Both, uh, both times when I, when I went to the U.S. Because I met Jews, I was staying with Jews, I talked to Jews, it just was so free. But uh, when I come here, when I got back to, to, to my real life, to my ordinary life, to my routine, just everything got so different and confused. I spent three weeks there, 20, 21 days. Like, we lived together. Like, we were sleeping in the same, uh, same place. We, are, we were eating on the same table. We were one. There's no difference between us. Like, uh, not like here. As you can see, the soldier behind me. I was born to a refugee family. My family in 1948 was thrown out from our village, Kebeba, in Beit Jibreen now. So it was not hard for me to join the First Intifada in 1987. And I was in a prison. I was arrested for three months in the beginning. Then uh, after eight months, I was released. I went back to prison for four years. I was courted to be 10 years in the prison. I got a phone call and I was informed that my older brother Yusuf was stopped and killed by Israeli soldiers in the entry of our village. I lost him and uh, I lost a very important reason to live. My background is a resistance background started from the age of my grandfather. We decided to start throwing stones on the settlers, on the army during our study in the schools, and to block the roads and to, you know, to disturb the, the settlers and the army. After that, uh, in the 80s, in the, at the beginning of the 80s, we were uh, kids, I think. They arrested us and uh, they sentenced us for years. The first intifada started 
1937. During the first intifada, I spent three and a half other years under administrative detention. We believe that the resistance is, is one of the rights of the occupied people to resist the occupiers in different way, even to use weapons against the army, against the, the occupiers. I believe in that, but I understood that going through this path for forever uh, is something useless. أتيبي حبيبي شو قصتك؟ United States United States If they come to Hebron and see what's going on they will change their attitude They divided the city for two parts because of 500 settlers. I remember the market when I was a child. It was full of people, full of uh, open shops, full of life. Now, I don't see, I don't see that there is a life here. It's, it's completely empty, the area here. I was born in the old city. And my house is a close military zone here, where I was born. I am against everybody who believes in killing the other. Sometimes I feel sorry for even seeing a soldier suffering. Not a civilian, a soldier. Because I see that soldier is a civilian from inside. I look to the people from inside. We are equal. We are human. As everybody in the world. What about our rights? We are below uh, Beit Hadassah settlement. In spite of the presence of the soldiers all over here and the cameras, but the settlers are uh, continuing throwing stones and attacking the people from up, and especially the people who are walking here. So the municipality put this fence to protect the Palestinians from the stones, from the empty bottles, from uh, the settlers' attack from up. The shops here were closed and welded by the army. Twelve shops here. From 1,800 shops were closed because of the closure policy in Hebron. And the settlers, they occupied the roofs and they created a kindergarten on the, on the roofs. And they created a playground for the settlers on, the, on this roofs, which is completely Palestinian and which is completely illegal, even uh, by the Israeli law. The soldiers all the time uh, are here. Protecting whom, I don't know. But it's a closure policy, it's occupation policy. To have soldiers, to have police, to have uh, settlers in, in the middle of Hebron. Here it used to be Hebron. If you talk about Hebron, that you have to come here. All the parking, all the kind of shops, the wholesale market, as I told you, were here. No, now the settlers only are allowed to be here. What exactly is this occupation that we're talking about? What do we mean when we say that Palestine is occupied? So now we're going into the West Bank, into Area C. 
which is under full Israeli control. Red triangle in this map, this is a map of the, a large map of the West Bank, represents a permanent checkpoint. There are also hundreds of flying checkpoints. Um, there's a common myth that, uh, uh, or idea, um, that uh, checkpoints are between Palestine and Israel, between the West Bank and Israel, um, um, trying to protect people from Palestinians from coming into Israel. But actually, 80% of checkpoints are within the West Bank itself. We talked a lot about uh, the, the checkpoints controlling movement. The wall is an indispensable part of this system of control. because it's not on the Green Line. It doesn't encompass all the settlements. And settlements on both sides of the wall are growing. So it's basically a, a barrier, a separation barrier for people. So at this point, this side of the wall is uh, municipal Jerusalem, according to Israel, and the other side is Area B of the Palestinian Authority. Well, it's of course a very uh, difficult position for the Palestinians, but it's a necessary evil because it protects Israeli citizens from Palestinian terrorists. On this side we're on Abu Dis, on that side we're on Abu Dis. So there's not separating here between Jews and Arabs, they're separating between Arabs and Arabs. And so you'd be arguing that the Arabs on that side of the wall are somehow more dangerous than the Arabs on this side of the wall. It's the same neighborhood on both sides of the wall here. I mean, this is an or a neighborhood that grew organically. I used to go shopping there a lot. A lot of people from Jerusalem did. Things were a bit cheaper, get your car fixed and so on. Now there's, there's no access um, other than going through the checkpoint and around. You speak to most Israelis, they've heard of it, they've seen it on television, Sometimes, some of them have seen pictures, but you don't feel it on the landscape. For Palestinians, these borders are very, very real and very palpable. Here the wall is coming from either camp, from either refugees camp, and after go outside to go to Bethlehem city. You know the Palestinian is refused the wall. Maybe sometimes throw the rock, maybe sometimes uh, do some activity between, beside the wall just to say to Israel, we are here. Here the wall, sometimes I say we have good benefits from the wall. Some, some, some people say you are joking. No, I, I, that's true. Now I have some places in the world to express about myself. From painting or from I want to write anything, uh, refuse Israel, anything about Palestine, I can express in my in the hall here. And here the cinema is small cinema maybe. Small cinema to, to show some filming.
here we're about five kilometers from the Green Line. So we're already about a quarter of the way into the West Bank. And yet this is still municipal Jerusalem. The way the government defines Jerusalem, and I'll show you later on the map, is, uh, is quite convoluted. I mean, the, the Greater Jerusalem actually covers almost 10% of the West Bank. represents today uh, a, a line of compromise that the Palestinians have by and large agreed upon for, for recognition um, uh, of Israel and peace with Israel and normalized relations with Israel. The Saudi plan um, is a unanimous plan agreed upon by all 22 Arab countries um, that they will normalize relations with Israel uh, if, they, if they establish a Palestinian state on the Green Line. So every time you build over the Green Line, um, you're basically uh, violating um, this, this, this possibility of, of compromise with the, the, the Palestinians. And it's actually a rather generous plan, given that 78% of the land would go to, to Israel. East Jerusalem is um, unique in that the um, 70 square kilometers surrounding West Jerusalem was actually formally annexed to the state of Israel. No country other than Israel recognizes this annexation, um, not even the United States. The per percentage of the, of the population in Jerusalem that's Palestinian is about one third, or 35 percent, 36 percent. The number of the amount of the budget that they receive uh, is anywhere between five and eight percent. And you see the, the master plan for Malaya Dumim, which is a big settlement we're going to visit next. It goes in this little finger, almost all the way to Jericho. Although Malaya Dumim, the built-up area, is just here. They have a master plan. You see, this could be Miami Beach, you know, with the palm trees and, and, and the infrastructure. It's, uh, it's a very pleasant place to live. It's a settlement that was started in the late 70s. It started as an ideological settlement. Um, eventually, the Israeli government st uh, started to take part in it and subsidize houses. There are 40,000 people living here now. There are plans to expand it up until 150. It's a no-brainer for most people. Cheap housing, out in the hills, in the fresh air, um, government subsidies, why not? Why not? The other thing that we can see is, can you see this, this uh, cluster of, of homes that look somewhat out of place, this building of uh, five stories with the square windows? It's a settlement called No Zion, we're actually at their advertising site. This kind of idea of a settler as, uh, as um, very ideologically driven, racist, um, probably fundamentally religious. Um, this is certainly one kind of settler, but it's not, it's, it's, a, it's a minority. Without question, the people who, who made the plans to build this, uh, this, this settlement know exactly what and where uh, they're building. Um, but the people moving in don't necessarily know or care. It's not necessarily ideological at all. So essentially what we're doing is kind of layering one state on top of another, in a sense with all the Jewish settlements with about half a million settlers living in them, all connected by, by settler roads which link into the Israeli highway system. I mean, the kind of investment we've made in the West Bank is not the kind of investment that a country makes if it intends to pull out. But we're creating an infrastructure for a de facto single state. When a Palestinian says, my home was demolished, and another Palestinian said, I lost my ID, and another Palestinian said, I, I can't find work, 
it's not just these kind of isolated cases of injustice or, you know, one Israeli who's, who's racist or ten Israelis who are racist. There's this idea of on the, on the governmental level, uh, on, the, on the political policy level of dispossession, of economic depression, in addition to fight, fighting the humanitarian fallout from, from these policies, is to actually make this into a political struggle against the Israeli government and Jerusalem, the Jerusalem municipalities, very directed racism toward the native inhabitants of, of this land. We are going uh, as we are, we are because we are invited and we are guests and there's nothing to be scared of. I am uh, in struggle against occupation since the war, 67. So is tear gas usually the worst thing that happens or does no, the No, it's army... not the worst thing. The worst thing is, is bullet in the head. My parents are uh, Zionist immigrants from the 1920. There was about a million Palestinians and a few hundred thousand uh, Jews in Palestine before the Second World War. It started about four years ago, struggle against the separation fence, which is uh, cutting half of the village uh, lands in order to build on them the settlement Modin Elite, which is built on the lands of uh, the villages around. And uh, about two years ago, the highest court uh, gave a verdict that uh, the, 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 the road of the separation fence is not for security, it's for annexation, and that it must be moved uh, to give back half the lands. But uh, till now, nothing was happened. Still have not changed the road. And we continue the demonstration. It is a symbol now in all Palestine. Belin is the symbol. This is the only one that uh, continue without uh, without cessation for already far, four years. What are you cu uh, curious about? Uh, about the other side, about the protest, see what's going on in West Bank. I don't have any Palestinian friends or acquaintances. I'm spending most of my my time in Tel Aviv, so I'm reading the news as everybody else. So. But it's not the same thing as going and, and see for yourself. We're both uh, yeah. ex, ex IDF soldiers. And uh, it's unusual to see them as the other side. It's also a sort of an atonement. I served as, the, as a sergeant in the occupied uh, Gaza Strip in the late 80s, early 90s. Basically, I went there uh, because I believe that uh, someone uh, with strong leftist convictions may be able to, you know, um, lessen the violence, uh, prevent uh, unauthorized uh, violence and, and brutality. That did not work very well. Sometimes you, you are witness to um, things you didn't actually think you would see. It's ingrained in you to obey orders. You're under heavy pressure, social pressure, to obey orders, not to break, not to break ranks, be one of the um, one of the guys. When you get an order, you have to obey. And it's the same goes both ways. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot be right wing and get an order to evacuate uh, settlers and say, okay, I'm not doing it because you're a soldier. Your mission is to obey. If you, if you think you cannot do it, just don't go to the army. I didn't think of myself as something militaristic, but uh, we wanted to go to the army to, to be men and to, to fight, to see how it is. And, uh, and uh, we didn't have moral uh, or political uh, problems with this because uh, it, the army wasn't something political. I was very proud, I have a picture I probably hear somewhere of myself in the uniform and my mother standing beside me and obviously very proud to see her son in the uniform of the army of the Jewish state. I don't know what you do and do not know about Israel and conscription, but it's not like in the United States. It's mandatory for all Jewish citizens as well as some non-Jewish minorities. It's a two-year service uh, for females and a three-year service for males at the very least, and this is mandatory by law. For many years already now, uh, draft dodging, as it's called in Israel, is becoming a widespread phenomenon. Uh, and even according to army statistics, uh, these days up to 40% of those meant to serve don't actually serve. When our oldest son was 15, he approached us and said that he refused to serve in the military on the grounds of his belief in pacifism. And that was sort of like dumping ice water on my head. The thing that most helped uh, me uh, to get to my decision is the dialogue uh, between me and Palestinians. Uh, in these dialogues, I um, ask them questions and, and check my, um, you know, what I believe in. And by their answer, I, I start to see that it's not uh, you know, the only truth that I uh, thought about. And, um, and then I start to see the reality from their, uh, uh, from their eyes. It wasn't just a matter of sympathy with the Palestinians. More and more it became obvious that this was a calamity for Israel. And this is what people are not so much aware of. They think that we're, we're doing terrible things to the Palestinians. We're doing terrible things to ourselves. I saw my friends with whom I served in basic training and later on the medics course just turn into different people and I did not like what I saw. To me, it, the whole process began during the Second Intifada. Um, I started asking questions why there were bombings all the time in my city. And after witnessing a bus bomb myself, I really sort of felt an emotional as well as an intellectual need to understand what was going on. There was that moment when suddenly hit me. I said, no, I, this, is, this is absolutely sickening. I refuse to have any more part in it. And the, uh, the, the ironic thing is that I wasn't, it wasn't that I, I saw some terrible uh, um, brutalization of a Palestinian. I saw a, a, a grove of almond trees being uprooted in the Sinai Desert. And that broke my heart. So this is, until that, this was the time when Israel was the land that made the desert bloom. And here was Israel in the form of a, an Israeli army tractor uprooting this wonderful grove of almond trees that by great patience and a great devotion had been uh, growing in the desert. This was in the Sinai Desert where there's very little water and somebody had put in a lot of hard work to make those trees grow and here was a bulldozer uprooting it. Slowly, slowly, you get to fight with other people in the unit because you don't like you used to be a very good friend. You don't like the way he acts. You don't like the way you act or the way you act about how he acts. Then uh, the unit was kind of divided into two. There was the, the people that were 
wild, and the people that were non-wild, the wild people, they became more wild because there was non, non wild people in the patrols or the, the checkpoint uh, shifts or whatever. I guess what happened is uh, in the end there was more violence and more wildness. Yes, there's a limit, meaning there's a limit to obedience, there's a limit to, to uh, what an army can demand of its soldiers without them becoming criminals. And soldiers have to be aware of that, they have to be taught, and they have to be taught to stand up at a certain point and say, the order you've just given me is, is a criminal order, is flagrantly illegal, and I refuse to obey it. My village is called Jayus, located in Kalkilia district in the northern of the West Bank. You can see uh, maybe from here the settlement in the, uh, there. It, there it, it is uh, for Jayus land. There is uh, near to three or four settlement here. Do you like to go to the gate? The Israeli government announced the construction of the wall in 2002. So uh, everyone, when he, he wants to go to his land, he must have a permit. And in this time, it is very hard to get a permit. It is safe for you, maybe you can tell if they ask you that you go there to take a photos only. This is the time for the gate to open and uh, for the farmers to go out. They say there is a problem for the army and they close this ga the gate. They close the gate and there are some farmers they waiting for them to open the gate again. She is one from the EABBI, the attend of this case. They came to the gate to see when the, the, when the farmer they have any problem. And they know some organization that they can help in this case. She's from Swiss. She's a good friend. They open it now. Oh, they open good. it again. I call the hotline. Maybe they call them. Maybe because they was been the allowed for one, and after that they close the gate. All of the people here in the village they don't agree this wall, so they start making administration. When the army they saw the people they arrived there they start uh, tire gas, and they start. Uh, uh, arrested some of the of the people, and uh, sometimes also the shooting uh, uh, robot uh, life for the people. After we had this demonstration, the most of the days the, the army they came and they make curfew in the village. And the curfew has been sometimes all the day, and sometimes 10 hours. And they don't allow for anyone to go out, and they close all the shops, and uh, nobody he can go out for pray or for anything. They told him to close the door and go inside. He said that everyone you must stay at home is better. Because uh, uh, for JU's people, you must stay at home, it could be better for you, uh, yourself. Sometimes that uh, when they want to arrest some people, they make a curfew and they don't allow for anyone to go out. And if they catch anyone out, they put handcuffs in his hand and they took him. And like you hear now, don't uh, worry, they uh, tire the uh, sound bump many times. Uh. And they came in the middle of the night and they, they tire like this sound bump and in the houses also. Sometimes for all night, sometimes for just a few hours. We never know. It really depends. Many times when people come, I tell them, you can come, but you know, maybe you cannot go back in the evening. You should not, if you want to come Friday, you should not have something planned on Saturday morning. But in the fact, this is not life in this situation.
But I did not come here to demonize Israelis um, tonight. I came here to also explain why Israel is like this. And as an Israeli, I feel like it's in my obligation also. Because um, Israelis aren't bad people, and necessarily not, not worse than any other uh, you know, society. Um, but there are a lot of things that, that make Israelis feel the way that they do, and I think I should discuss them. So the first is really that we are raised in fear. are very, very fearful for the existence and we are very much taught from our grandparents, from our families that, you know, there's a notion of that the only way for, for Jews to survive as a people is to have uh, a strong state and more importantly a strong army to defend it and this is the only way that we can survive otherwise, you know, we might get killed again. And um, this fear, I'm not trying to undermine the Holocaust or all of these uh, terrible events that happened in the Jewish history, but the fact that Jews are so fearful of anyone who's not Jewish is very, very harmful to the peace process because negotiating um, with the Palestinians is, is very hard. There's a basic distrust of anyone who's not Jewish. It has a lot to do with the politics of fear which, uh, considering the history of the Jewish people, and particularly of the recent generations, it's not that difficult to uh, evoke fear and panic in the Israeli uh, uh, population. People are fearful for their lives. Uh, there's a common belief that we are one little country and we're surrounded by a lot of enemies and their desire is to push us into the sea. Israel society chooses to focus on the people that uh, hate people, and she don't focus at all on other people. Um, so the picture that the, uh, the picture that the normal Israeli gets from the TV or the press or books or the discussion around him is just focus on the, the people that hate him and not the people that don't. It's like healing from this historical fear. When I, if I am a Jew and I see an Israeli activist who could come and be with Palestinians, save, and they treat him with dignity and love and justice, then my fear as a Jew will, will become healing in a way. Well, let's be honest. I mean, there are certain supporters of the Palestinian people who do so for the wrong reasons. And it's not because they care about Palestinians, and it's not because they care about human rights and international law and dignity for everyone. It's because they do have anti-Semitic tendencies. And, you know, the Palestinian people don't need David Duke as their supporter, for example. That being said, I think those people are really few and far between in terms of who is supporting the just and legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people to freedom and dignity and equality and independence in their own homeland. When the Second Intifada came, and I have some contacts with Israeli teachers who believe in peace and uh, to live with each other, two states and so on, and at that time, I bring the people, uh, those people to the village to talk to the people. And I face many problems with the people. Oh, you bring Jewish. So I was hearing this word from the people of the village that uh, you bring Jewish to the, to the village. Why you are bringing? At that time, the people in my village didn't distinguish between uh, uh, Jewish, left, right, with the Palestinian rights or not. All of them are the same. And through our demonstrations, they saw two different faces of the Israelis. The Israelis who are beside us, and they saw them arrested by the Israelis, and they saw them beaten by the soldiers, and they saw the soldiers. So the Palestinians distinguish. If they were Americans, it would be the same way. If they are French, it would be the same way. If they were Turkish, it would be the same way. Palestinians have resisted the Turkish occupation during the Ottoman Empire, as they have resisted the British during the British mandate in Palestine. And because it's an occupying power, regardless of whether 
they are Muslims or Christians or Jews or atheists or whoever they are. This is an occupation power that we are talking about. It's not about religion. Not that there's not hatred, not that there's not anger, of course there is, but it's not rooted in anti-Semitism, which was shocking for me. Um, and I didn't, it didn't feel against me personally. It felt very much against the conditions in which they're forced to live. They call it uh, the new anti-Semitism. It's based on uh, not like the old one, that uh, people hate Jews. Uh, now it's more uh, people don't like Israel behavior or um, uh, the, the way that, pe that Israel uh, do things. And I think it's very different because I can say that I don't think that Israel right in many cases, but it's not make me anti-Semitist. For Israel to claim that criticism of its policies is derived from anti-Semitism, that's what really sets Israel apart from other countries. Israel always claims that they're being held up to a double standard, that they're being singled out for actions. It's really just the opposite. You know, when U.S. politicians and the U.S. media hold Israel on a pedestal and say that Israel's actions and Israel's policies don't get to be criticized and don't get to be held up to the same standards that we treat other countries, that's what's singling Israel out. This is one of the entrance of Shohada Street, which closed completely for the Palestinians. The army, they use it just to go outside to attack houses and to search the Palestinian houses outside the restricted area. Care about the others, the others will care about you. I care about them because I have some Israeli friends, they care about me. If I feel sick, I, they will call me and ask what's going on. If the settlers attack me, they will, uh, will call me and ask what's going on. We are sorry. But the other Palestinians who are really suffering from the settlers, they don't have anybody from Israel care about them. I hope that all the Israeli, they push the government to stop this violation because it's affecting, uh, affecting them in an indirect way. Nobody in Israel asked himself why the Palestinian they hate uh, Jewish. Why the Palestinian throw stones or why some suicide bombers they go to Tel Aviv. This is the reasons. As a Palestinian, I don't see that uh, an excuse to be violent, but I can understand it. Go to the roots to any problem, you can solve it. Six hundred checkpoints in the West Bank, all the single details of dehumanizing in your daily life. Do you need anybody to teach you how to hate Israel? If you grow up in such conditions, you don't need that. You don't need a specific curriculum for hatred. It will do the job for you. We are pushing the Palestinians into a corner where they have nothing to lose. And there's nothing more dangerous than an enemy who has nothing to lose. Things can't get any worse. I might as well blow myself up. That is, that's the worst of the worst. Doing these things, you have to justify them to yourself only by saying, the, oh, these people only understand force. We have to show them who's boss. They're not really like us. They're second class. They're in some way to dehumanize them. But you can't have security while you're oppressing people because people will always resist their oppression. If not, they're not fully human beings. If not, they're servile and Palestinians are not servile, and they're never going to accept a condition of permanent oppression by Israel. Now, in specific, some people do actually teach their children or they want to educate their children to become fighters, and others also teach their children how to be nonviolent, and others teach their children how to educate themselves. You know, this 
media focuses on this thing specifically. The media show the Palestinians as only capable of throwing stones or burning tires or exploding themselves, as if we are born with genes of hatred or violence. Nobody is born with genes of hatred or violence. Nobody is born to hate. For every other culture and country, all these people who were resisting the occupation, they are their heroes. Israeli terrorists, Jewish terrorists who were during the British mandate posted as terrorists became prime ministers in Israel. People who committed massacres against Palestinian villages, complete Palestinian villages were destroyed. And they became their prime ministers. Why do they permit themselves to do things that they deny to others? Palestinians are not angels, but uh, we're a nation seeking freedom and independence. And this is what, what is now seen as illegitimate by many others was legitimate 60 years ago. I mean, when there were so many countries under occupation, they were fighting in all ways possible. And so we're doing the same, basically. The second Intifada started. I decided not to participate in this Intifada because I'm not completely convinced that we should go through this uh, route. Uh, there is a lot of alternatives to resist the occupation and to show and to send another message to the international community. Then one of my friends told me that there is an, some Israeli uh, refusers, or the people who refuse to serve in the army, they would like to meet you. Uh, my mother got a phone call from Israeli bereaved man. He was a religious Jew. And he told her that he, have, he has lost his son. His son was a soldier and he was kidnapped and killed by Hamas. And uh, his name is Haq Frankintan. And they set a group with bereaved Israeli families and they looking for partners from the other side to talk and to work for peace and reconciliation, even though the high price that they paid. That was my first shock. My second shock why when my mother accept them in our home. Then when we invite them to our home, after 30 minutes, Israeli, Palestinian, bereaved families, including me, my mother, my brothers, everybody was crying at that home. And for me, I used to have Israelis in my home, but not crying, not guests, not having coffee. I used to taste what they cause us when they come to our home. But it, I never saw the respect from their eyes, not just from their behavior. So it convinced me that still hope, if those people who paid the high price could believe in my right and could recognize my suffering and my pain, so maybe there is a chance. So I decided to, to, start, to start the contacts with the Israelis because I, I realized that there is some good Israelis that we can talk to. Even politically, I cannot take a revenge because Palestine for me is not a case of revenge. It's a case of right. As a human being, first of all, not even as a Palestinian. Nonviolence, it's a very great tool which the Palestinians used in the first Intifada. Our nature is the nonviolent. We want our kids to be aligned in and to grow up on non-violent resistance. This means that you will have a, a new generation who believes in non-violent and they are able to have their rights. I believe that if you want to use force, then you are weak. I don't believe at all that violent or military resistance will lead us for a solution as Palestinians. So the idea of creating the beautiful resistance against the ugliness of occupation and its violence as a way to break these cultural stereotypes and to show another image of Palestine, to reclaim and defend 
this beauty and the humanity and culture that we have in our soul, this nonviolence that is practiced since years, years, years. Listen, nonviolent, it's the art of using your anger. It's the, the effective way of using your pain. Was there a protest at all? No, because uh, they know that the, the demonstration starts every Friday after uh, they finish the break. Uh -huh. So they came before this uh, Friday because they don't want anyone to go there. And they say it is fair to They don't allow it, uh, even for the people to go to pray. The owner of this house, he lives in Saudi Arabia, and there is nobody in this house, only his cousin. So every Friday they go to this house and they stay in the room. And do you see when they make the care that we are stay like we are staying in jail? Nobody he can go. We are not free. We cannot go to to continue our work. We cannot go to work. Just we can stay uh, all the time in the house, and it is really we are feel boring of that, because it is also not one day. The most of the days they came and they make care of. You. And it's a sound bomb. You think that the army they came because of the stones? They came because you know, they know that uh, you know that we are here. We don't have weapon to fight the army. Just we can make the uh, fight him of the, the stones, and the stones make nothing for the jeep or for the army. But they, maybe they thought that if we start throwing a stone after that, that we will start of other thing, start uh, fighting him of weapon or something. So if anyone th throw stone, they came and they took him to jail. Rubber it? bullets can kill you if it's shot at close, close range. Wow. It's, it's, it's deadly at 30 meters. Assalamu alaikum. Oh shit, that was a bullet. No. Oh, I don't know. That was a bullet. I think it's becoming increasingly difficult for Israel to maintain this facade of innocence and victimhood. And that's both within the general population in the United States and also amongst Jewish Americans. 
And I think that that kind of mainstream discourse has cracked wide open in recent years. Following the 2006 uh, Israeli war on Lebanon, and more importantly in terms of changing public perceptions, Israel's 2008 to 2009 war on the Gaza Strip really opened up a lot of people's eyes to the re really brutal nature of Israeli policy towards Palestinians. And Israel and its supporters in the United States are fearing right now that they're losing the discourse battle. The struggle is being seen more in the light of self-determination, of freedom, of independence, and that Israel is blocking these things uh, from being uh, achieved for the Palestinian people. I mean, from what we saw with the Jewish community that we met, there is a change. Um, there is criticism, and even uh, stuff like J Street, um, this is something that didn't happen a few years ago, and I think it's good. But if you look at the Israeli society, it goes more right-wing and more right-wing, and I don't know if we're going to a good direction. <laughs> Well, I think that the history of oppression that Jews have faced throughout the millennia can be interpreted in one of two ways for contemporary Jews around the world. Either the message is terrible things were done to us and we were oppressed so we shouldn't do the same things to other people and we should work for a world in which that type of oppression doesn't take place to anyone. Or the other lesson that can be learned is that, well, this is the way the world works and, you know, it just is this way and that therefore let's not be stupid and let's be strong and let's do what everyone else does. So I think there's two ways of, of learning this lesson and I see, I, I believe that within the Jewish community, especially you're seeing this today within divisions in the Jewish American community, you can definitely see that split shaping up in terms of how Jewish Americans relate to Israel and its policies. So what do you guys think so far? Uh, a bit scary. scary. Yeah. yeah. If Israel could overcome their fear, if they succeed to do this, Israel will survive. Because you cannot occupy a nation for years and expect you will live in security. You cannot do that. Palestinians are under occupation. And if you can do something, just come to visit Palestine. And then you will see the reality. And you'll, then you will be an ambassador for the reality, for the truth. Come and judge. Don't say that I am with the Palestinians or with the Israelis. Come and see, and you can judge issues on the ground. One of the things that, that, that changed my opinion about, about the area is going to Palestine and speaking to people and all my stereotypes and my um, preconceived ideas um, being very seriously challenged. Okay, you don't accept this, but what do you do to make a difference? What is your life means if you don't try to make a change? We wish this incubation will be in. And everything there is in for everything. And I wish it will be soon, the end of the incubation.
Thank you.